Well, 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 it's Friday the 13th of November. Mars is now direct in brave and assertive Aries. Plenty of energy and drive. This is episode 2045 of 301 Permanently Moved or Online, a personal podcast 301 seconds in length, written, recorded and edited in one hour by me at the JMO. I've been thinking a lot recently about video games, RPGs, war games and computing in general, reading about how tightly they are bound up with one another in their shared origins. Some of this came through in the pre-pandemic days of episode 2008, where I was thinking aloud about D&D, stats and simulation. Some of the other bits will show up in the next Dimensino post on my blog about permissive IPs. Anywho's, this week I've been reading the IF Theory Reader, edited by K. Jackson Mead and J.R. Wheeler, published in 2011. It's a very niche book about the history, craft and theory of interactive fiction. It contains some fantastic essays. I recommend the book to anyone who even has a passing interest in twine games or interactive fiction. I also recently watched Jason Scott's 2010 film, Get Lamp, the text adventure documentary. It's amazing. I'm finding so much value in old books and writing on cyberspace right now because they remind me of the excitement and possibility of what the web could have been. The web we lost. I've just picked up the 1998 book Hamlet on the Holodeck, The Future of Narrative in Cyberspace by Janet H. Murray for £3.50 on eBay and Finite and Infinite Games by James Curse on Paul Sager's recommendation for three quid. Bargains. I can't wait for them to arrive. The first interactive fiction program was Colossal Cave, released in 1975. MUDs, or multi-user dungeons, came soon after. By 1978, these games were in heavy use on various university Plato systems. They quickly increased in sophistication, 3D graphics, storytelling, user involvement, team play, and depth of objects and monsters in the dungeons, etc. The first chat system was used by the US government in 1971. Its first use came during President Nixon's wage price freeze under Project Delphi. The system was called MSARI and allowed 10 regional offices to link together in real-time online chat. It's weird to think that real-time chat technology is 50 years old. Email is nearly 60. These technologies are so old and yet so young. Former Boomer colleagues of mine have been moaning on LinkedIn about using Discord or Slack for the first time all year. Last month, in episode 2040 on abstract objects, I spoke about metaphors and code environments, specifically chat rooms, and I said, chat rooms aren't really rooms in any sense, but I can see why people that invented them gave them that name, as good as name as any to express and conceptualize their room-like qualities. Do you think of your group chats as being kinds of rooms? During the interactive fiction binge this week, I found an essay, The Rumours Metaphor in Interactive Fiction by Nathan Jerp, which speaks to my question about them last month. Rooms as metaphors in IF were in use right up to and including the early point-and-click LucasArts games. Tim Schafer still uses this terminology when referring to locations in virtual worlds that contain puzzles. Jerp's essay interrogates the metaphor of a room when thinking about virtual environments. Let's apply some of the terms Jerp uses when discussing interactive fiction to chat rooms as the metaphors should hold across environments. The first heading in the essay is tangibility. Rooms are tangible metaphors as rooms tend to be fully observable by the user within the structure of the code space, structures that lend themselves well to modularity. Jerp suggests that with a playwright's eye, we might recompose activities that occur in rooms as scenes. Instead of moving from room to room or multiple locations, a room may host a series of scenes. Activity in group chats generally comes in fits and bursts. If we consider these flurries of activity as scenes, what sort of UX could be developed in chat apps or even Zoom rooms with the idea of scenes? Rooms also have spatial versus temporal qualities. Spatial in that activities occur inside of rooms with clear boundaries. But what if a chat room UX moved, shifted, or came from nowhere only later to disappear altogether? A group of friends in a group chat navigating a shifting metaphor. I've always wanted to be able to start subchats inside the verticality of a chat feed like starting a thread in a forum, little bubbles of subchats below the surface of the stream. Another feature of rooms is crowdedness. If you are in as many discords as I am, you'll be familiar with dropping by, contributing for a bit, and then marking everything else as red. Busy chats do have a sense of crowdedness. Another feature of crowdedness is that an individual's actions are typically visible for others in the room to witness. I wonder how the subchats UX I mentioned would change the experience of a discord or telegram. Less channels, probably. Strange topologies. In the conclusion, in the context of interactive fiction, Jeppe notes, individuals operating inside a room metaphor are locked in to the role of the protagonist, but notes this is also worth reconsidering. What would it mean to participate in a group chat where each individual does not consider themselves to be the protagonist or central agent? 
playable UXs for the win.